Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining me tonight. My name is Ann Crawford, and I'm the Assistant Branch Manager and Adult Services Librarian at the Ponte Vedra Beach Branch Library. And tonight I am Zooming from home with Nina de Gramont, the author of The Christie Affair, which has hit the New York Times bestseller list. We're very excited to talk with her tonight about her experiences as an author, and as well as um, all of the things that we want, the burning questions we want to know about her book which is a great blend of true crime as well as fiction and a lot of other really spicy, interesting things in between. But before we dive into the really exciting part of our event, I just wanted to let you know, um, right now we have your um, video cams and um, your audio muted and your video cams turned off just so that you can focus on the conversation between myself and Nina de Gramont. And this event is being recorded and so you will be able to watch it at a future time and share it with anybody who may have missed tonight's event. I wanna thank the friends of the Ponte Vedra Beach Branch Library for buying us a Zoom account so we could host special events just like this. Um, my colleague, Lisa Calvert, who is helping me run everything behind the scenes, uh, the Book Lovers Book Club at the Ponte Vedra Library for the wonderful questions they provided me. I, have a grand total of 20, just like I did last time when I interviewed Nita Prose of The Maid in June, if you were able to catch that event. And of course, I wanna thank Nina de Gramont, our wonderful author who will be conversing with tonight um, for giving us her time and sharing her insights about her book and about herself and giving us that opportunity that most of us never get a chance to have, which is to read a really great book, um, or wait on the wait list for a really great book to read and then be able to ask those questions that you usually don't get to post towards authors, but this time you do. And if you have any additional questions, I'll do my best to check the chat, see if I can incorporate those into our conversation. But now um, over to the exciting part of our event, let's give a big warm welcome to Nina de Gramont of The Christie Affair. Yay! Thank you so much, Anne. I appreciate it so much. Okay, well, we're so glad to have you join us. And I thought before we dive into the questions, if you wouldn't mind telling us a little bit about yourself as a, as a person, as an author, um, anything that you would like to share with us, just to go ahead and break the ice. Sure. So I live in Wilmington, North Carolina, which is the southeast part of the state, right on the coast. Um, I teach creative writing at the University of North Carolina, Wilmington. Um, I um, have written, gosh, um, I'm strangely blanking on the number, I think eight or nine books. <laughs> I think The Christie Affair is my ninth book. Um, and um, I have a 19 year old daughter who's heading to college for the first time at the end of the month, um, or actually the end of next month. And The Christie Affair is really my first um, historical novel. So that was. I'm sh I imagine some of the questions surround that process, so I can answer them from a very fresh perspective because it was a, a new, very daunting experience for me. I imagine. I imagine there was a lot of research that went into that to yes. have your novel that is a somewhat fictionalized account, but is also dovetailing um, with factual details of things that actually occurred which would be yeah. a really tricky thing to do, to take something that could just be written straight as nonfiction, true crime, and give it a more narrative, fictionalized storytelling type of feel. In fact, some of our questions actually pertain to that. So okay. I'm glad that you mentioned eight or nine books because one of our, um, one of our readers actually noticed off the cuff, and I admit as a librarian, I missed this, and this is why I love our patrons, because they are so incredibly smart, so incredibly clued in. And as a librarian, I'm learning something every day, even though I've done it for 19 years. And one of the things she noticed is that you not only write under um, Nina de Gramont, you write under another, another name. And so when I said that I had some of your books that we purchased in the library, I may not have gotten all of them. So do you write under two different names? Um, I have written, I wrote um, two books under pseudonyms and they were both kind of just one-offs. Um, one, I don't necessarily recommend to the library, um, but the other one, which I do recommend um, modestly, is um, The Distance From Me To You, which I wrote under the name Marina Gessner. 
Um, mm -hmm. And it's sort of my, um, my, the actual name, of, everyone has always called me Nina, but the name on my birth certificate is Marina. And then Gessner is my husband's last name, which I don't use, but so it's sort of my, my alternate life name oh. as well as my pseudonym. Kind of like Nora Roberts and J.D. Robb, you get a, you get an yeah, author. exactly. You kind of write under different genres, different names, everything like that. So I'm going to have to look that up because I initially went with Nina de Vermont. I need to go look under, is it Marina Gessler? Is that what you said? Gessler, yeah. It's um, I need to look under Marina Gessler yeah. and make sure I pick up some books that way too. So <laughs> excellent. Like I said, those, those readers, they're sharp. They don't miss a thing. So one of the first questions that we had about the Christie affair um, was a great way to open the conversation, which is, are you an Agatha Christie fan and why? And what is your favorite mystery by her? Um, so the answer in the present tense is yes. Since I've written this book, I have become a great fanatic Agatha Christie fan. Um, prior to writing the book, um, this is something that I wish that I hadn't started admitting way back when I first started doing interviews, particularly when I was doing the interviews in England, but I had never read an Agatha Christie novel. I, I mean, clearly, obviously I knew who she was and I'd seen movies based on her novels, but I had never read one. Um, but when I was researching the book, I read a you know, great big stack of them and really loved them. I think that she is um, a great wit, um, obviously a great storyteller. I think it's so impressive the way she clearly tried to challenge herself in terms of the structure and the different ways she approached every book. Um, and my favorite, it's a, it's a very boring answer, but I think that Murder on the Orient Express is her masterpiece. Yes, yes. She has a lot of classics and I don't think that's an embarrassing thing to admit at all. It's like when someone comes into the library and says, saw the movie before I read the book and my answer is always hey whatever it takes whether you go in a door a window come down the chimney as long as you read no judgment on the part of the library we're, yeah, we're glad I, people read if you read in print if you if you listen to audiobooks if you do downloadables if you're reading the side of the milk carton whatever it is just you know just do it so however you get to um the things that you love um you know, it's all a matter of process and really if, and this is totally uncopyrighted, if you ever want to use it in an interview, um, you can always say that, you know, Agatha Christie by um, coming up with this book um, brought you to a really great author and maybe through this book is going to bring other people to Agatha Christie that may not have read her before. Yeah. So in a way, you're doing us all a favor for those people who haven't read Agatha Christie or maybe haven't read a lot of her books they'll have an inspiration to find out more about her as an author because she certainly um, illuminated that angle about her or you made her very much a real person like everybody else but also she was this tremendous author at a time where women were very much doubted for that not only that talent but talent in that particular genre to, you know, at a time where I'm sure it was hard to put a woman's name on those murder mysteries. Yeah, yeah, and I, I, mean, I, I don't think that anybody should be daunted by the fact that they were written so long ago because I think that she was really ahead of her time and there's really a spare contemporary fast-paced feel to all of them. She is, and she's inspired so many other authors that came after her. Um, she was the reason that I think a lot of people were inspired to, to write in that genre. It is such a popular genre. It is the most popular genre we have in the St. John's County library system. And we even have some new books um, that relate to Agatha Christie. We have The Science of Murder. It's a nonfiction mm -hmm. book about um, all the different things that she researched, all her different poisons and everything like that. And it even makes a point about how... Um, the fact that she did this research on poisons rather than giving people bad ideas of which poisons to use. On the contrary, people were recognizing what kinds of poisons might have been at work and were then getting people help for antidotes for these poisons based off of learning about poisons from her books. Oh, how neat. 
I thought that was really um, interesting. And I think Marie Benedict, a fellow author, wrote The Mystery of Mrs. Christie. So mm -hmm. it's such a rich, incredible true crime tale that there's so many different opportunities of so many different angles um, that you can take. And yeah, in fact, yeah, go ahead, please. I was just going to say it's fun because, um, you know, there's sort of when you're writing about a historical event, you sort of have the choice between making up your own events or, you know, recreating what's known historically, sort of putting yourself into the characters. But in this case, since it's kind of a blank slate, um, those 11 days that she was missing, um, it forces you to use your imagination. So I think it's really fun to see all the different theories and ideas and flights of fancy different people come up with. Yes, and that the fact that it's still unsolved, they still don't know what she was doing during those days of her disappearance. Yeah. So it is up for speculation and that does make for a really rich uh, mystery, which leads me to my next question, which is what do you think really happened to Agatha during her disappearance? Do you think it played out the way it did in your book or do you think maybe something else entirely different happened or maybe somewhere in between? Well, so it definitely didn't play out the way it played out in my book. My book is entirely fictional um, and I don't imagine that one shred of it actually happened in real life. Apart from, I mean, the, the, the aspects that I tried to depict with accuracy were the, what was going on when Agatha wasn't present um, in terms of the mechanics of the search and what was going on with um, the police and you know, sort of in general in the world around her and the newspaper headlines and things like that. Um, but the truth is the real mystery, she was, so she was on December 3rd, her husband asked her for a divorce um, that night. Um, and then he left town um, that night, her car was abandoned on the edge of a chalk pit. Um, it was discovered empty of her with, you know, some things that she might need like her coat and her driver's license and her suitcase. Um, and the truth is that the next day she registered at a spa hotel in Harrogate, which is in the north of England in um, Yorkshire. Um, and that's where she was discovered 14 days later. So they pretty much know what she was doing um, during those 11 days. She was doing what all of us would want to do on the heels of a horrible breakup, which is taking a vacation at a spa, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. getting massages and having trays brought to her room. Um, so the real mystery is why was that car abandoned? How did she get um, from Berkshire or as I've learned since talking to so many British people, it's pronounced Berkshire in England. How did she get from you know, the London area all the way to the North of England without a car, driver's license or personal effects? Um, and why didn't she come forward when this massively public search was going on? I mean, she had one of the, among the things they know about what she was doing during those 11 days was that she was reading a newspaper twice a day. So she, she had to have seen how desperately the whole world wanted to know where she was. Why didn't she come forward? And I mean, her explanation for that was that she was having a breakdown. Her mother had died the summer before. Her husband was leaving her. She was in the sort of um, fugue state brought on by um, the emotional breakdown because of those events and had just completely forgotten who she was. And that's why she didn't come forward. And then on the other side of it, she said, I just don't remember. I don't remember what happened. And I believe that um, certainly to a, a great extent, having read the um, book trauma certainly can do things to you that just kind of wipe you completely clean sure. and yet at the same time you very cleverly portrayed her I feel very accurately as a very shrewd and not calculating necessarily but a very shrewd and determined and kind of methodical person who was able to write these intricate mysteries and therefore kind of set up her own mystery in a way, maybe she wanted to be off the radar for 11 days and she was tired of feeling like her life was a spectacle. And she's like, you know, if ever there was someone who knows how to kind of disappear for a little while, yeah, maybe I know something about that. 
you know, well, you know what the, the thing, the detail, when I first found out about the disappearance, um, the detail that really made me think, ooh, this could be a novel, um, is that she registered at the hotel using her husband's, miss he was leaving her for another woman. So she used his mistress's last name to register at the hotel. Um, and I only found out when I read um, a review about, of my book, um, that one theory about why she might've done that was her husband was really adamant that she keep his mistress's name out of the divorce proceedings and not publicize it at all. So that that might've been her sneaky little way of um, outing, outing the mistress and her identity. Absolutely. Well, there's the old saying of hell hath no fury like a woman scorned. <laughs> and certainly um, the way that Archie was portrayed, um, not sympathetically at all, I could see absolutely why Agatha would not hesitate to pull out the stops to um, make things in some ways as public as, as possible. And yeah. she certainly had the, the means to do it. So I think it was very creative the way that you took the, the things that you knew and extrapolated from that to get her quite literally from point A to point B of how was the car left there. And I like I liked the detail about, well, she took a different car. There was another car. Yeah. So, you know, that, that felt very plausible to me. I didn't feel like I had to reach a lot as a, as a reader in terms of how do, how do I make this work? I felt like you helped me make it work. So I, I was really intrigued um, by that. And, and one of the questions that our readers had, and, and I agree is what inspired you to finally write your first historical fiction novel and write this particular novel? What, what kicked um, that off? So I had tried to write a novel years ago. In fact, the first sort of serious novel that I was ever contracted to write, um, after I had I published a collection of short stories was a novel about Emily Dickinson. And I researched and traveled to Amherst and um, toured you know, the Evergreens and the Homestead and read biographies and really immersed myself um, in all things Emily Dickinson before I went to try to write the novel. So when I sat down to come up with the story, I was really paralyzed um, and had a hard time sort of creating my own idea of what I wanted to have happen instead of just sort of regurgitating all these historical an anecdotes I discovered. Um, so I sort of, and then after that, you know, when I went to write contemporary books that were solely from my imagination, it was a huge relief. And I think it was really coming upon this particular story and the fact that before I started to write the book, Agatha Christie wasn't an author who was particularly precious to me the way Emily Dickinson was. Um, it felt like, okay, this is something I wanted to do. This is something I tried to do, wasn't able to do for reasons that I can see clearly. Um, so now I'm gonna take that experience and approach another attempt, sort of having learned what doesn't work. And that's why and before I started to write this book, I really, apart from reading the initial, um, article that inspired me, um, I didn't do any research at all. Um, I just sort of got the story down and made all the mistakes and sort of, you know, took what I thought I knew about the era and the place um, and then went back and, and made my best attempt to correct everything afterward. Maybe in a way by the fact that she wasn't completely precious to you, took a little bit of the pressure off of you to, yeah. to not feel so beholden to this particular person, did that give you a little bit more freedom? Absolutely, to write the story? because you know what I, what I really needed to do was um, create a character of Agatha that was entirely different from the actual Agatha Christie who you know existed. Um, and I think the fact that I, I, I think that it, I was I felt freer to do that, not knowing much about her and not having any any attachment to my own idealized versions of her. I could make her a real human. And I really appreciated that because it's interesting how kind of almost mythological authors can be, especially authors that are no longer with us. And 
it, I feel the same way about musicians because I was a musician for a long time and you hear about Mozart and you hear about Beethoven and you hear about Bach and they're like these larger than life figures but in reality in their own time period they were just little guys struggling to make ends meet and hoping beyond hope that somebody would commission um, to play to perform one of their um, orchestral pieces you know they were just scraping by until somebody recognized their talent and it's so different to read about them in that time frame as a person just trying to to get their ideas out there get that acceptance and read about them now long after they're long gone and they're completely famous and I felt the same way about Agatha Christie here she was she was just this English woman who had the same kinds of feelings most women would have about finding out your husband has as a mistress and he's leaving you to marry her and by the way she also happens to write some mysteries that have been pretty popular and you know kind of got for lack of a better way to say it's a little screwed over by her first publisher and the deal yeah. that she made so that all made it very much more relatable than if she had been Agatha Christie famous author she was just Agatha you know it's, and, it's like that. sorry to check when when I no, no, when no. I did after I'd written the first draft and I you know did my deep dive into her and all the various kinds of research I had to do, um, her personality in the nonfiction that she writes comes out in such a she's so um, self-effacing and modest in the way she describes herself and she has this um, she has a memoir her second husband was an archaeologist and she traveled to the Middle East with him um, on these digs in Syria and Turkey um, and Iraq. And she writes, in, so in this memoir, Come Tell Me How You Live, she, her husband has an assistant, his young assistant, who she worries doesn't like her. And there's so much in the memoir about these awkward exchanges that she has with him, her like worrying that he's reacting this way to something she said. And you're reading it and you're thinking, first of all, he was working for her husband. At this point, she was a world famous author. And here she is just agonizing over the belief that, you know, this man who she's traveling with might not like her. It's so, I mean, talk about relatable and just something that you wouldn't, you wouldn't imagine somebody of her stature in the world would grapple with the way the rest of us do. Well, absolutely. I mean, I feel that way talking to a New York Times bestselling author. And then I have to remember, well, Nina Grant around. she's still a woman like me, you know, she's yeah. still trying to get her ideas out there and, and get um get people reading and maybe doing it from a different angle than I than I do it. But um that I think that helps people feel like they can they can kind of put themselves in that person's shoes a bit yeah. more when um, they're a little bit more down to earth, a little bit closer to who we are and are still human beings. Yeah, and there's really, there's nobody to be intimidated by really. And I think it's so endearing when you see somebody who, um, like Agatha Christie, who has all the reasons in the world to comport herself like an intimidating person and you see a refusal not to do that. It's hard not to really love her. Absolutely, absolutely. And you touched on a little part of our next question, which was, did you know all the pieces before writing or was it like, you know, a continuous story and then you broke it up into kind of uh, flash forwards and, oh. well, not flash forwards, I guess, present and flashbacks. Right. So I don't know if the, if the people on here, should I be mindful of spoiling the book? Are there people here who haven't read it? That is a really dynamite question I would think most of the people have either I would have either read the book or don't mind spoilers so I think you're safe there okay I would imagine that you would watch it before um oh we even had a person say I've read it go ahead okay, okay. <laughs> I think most people who are still on the wait list probably aren't going to watch this until they've read the book so go okay. for it okay I'll, I'll still try to so the, the novel is narrated by a fictional version of Archie Christie's mistress. 
And she has a very specific reason beyond just being attracted to Archie for having this affair with him. When I originally started writing it, I knew what that motivation was. Like that was sort of the first um, thing I knew about the book. Um, as far as the structure goes, when I first started writing it, the first thing that I wrote was Nan's backstory, which is now peppered throughout the book. Um, in the first draft, that was front loaded in about 50 pages, um, which seems like a ridiculous idea at the time, but that's kind of how first drafts work. Um, and then um, when I went back to rewrite it, I saw really clearly that, you know, that section not only had to be longer, but had to sort of unravel along with the main story of the book. Um, and then there were, you know, there were other aspects, sort of what I would call subplots or even like adjacent plots. Um, in the original draft, there wasn't a murder. I mean, I, I, I wrote my original draft of the book. I took a break. I did a bunch of research. I read a lot of Agatha Christie novels. And that's when I kind of realized, oh, of course there has to be an homage to her in the form of um, a murder mystery um, snuck in there. And, um, and, and, and so, and, and because of what I'd written before, there was sort of a built-in motive for a murder mystery to come clear. So, I mean, it took me a long time to write this book and I wrote many, many, many drafts. And I would say that something, something major in terms of adding a storyline or um, fiddling with the structure came with each one. But the structure itself, um, you know, that was something I was doing right up to the end. I mean, it was probably the first book where I really, you know, took pieces out and physically spread them out and was moving them around instead of just working on the keyboard. That makes a lot more sense to me because I would imagine, and of course, I am not an author, but I would imagine as an author that if I got really hung up on the structure, I'd never write. I'd almost have to go ahead and get my ideas out on paper and then start arranging the pieces and kind of making the transition so that I could get from piece to piece because it's almost like when someone is determined not to write a first draft, they just want to write something perfectly the first time you never write. Exactly. Because you're sitting there constantly editing yourself. Right. So that makes a lot more sense to me that you would go ahead and just front load Nan's backstory and then kind of break it up and see where you're going to reveal it as you're going along. That makes a lot of sense. Good job. Thank you. Absolutely. <laughs> That's hard to write a novel, especially again, when you're beholden to real things and real people yeah. that exist. Yeah, it's hard no matter what. In ways, like there are aspects of being beholden to real things that exist that make it that give you gifts um, in terms of how to, you know, you don't have to come up with a style of dress or um, where something's gonna happen. You know, the time period and the actual historical people give you these little presents. Um, and I will say too, I read, um, so the original drafts were, you know, very much from Nan's point of view. Um, as I feel like the final book is, but I got the idea to have her narrate these third person sections um, because in Agatha Christie's novel, um, The ABC Murders, mm -hmm. it's, that's a first person narrative from it's either Captain or Colonel Hastings. I, I can't remember what his rank was at the time. Um, but so he's telling the story in first person and then all of a sudden there'll be these sections that are in third person and just with the header not from the personal narrative of Captain Hastings. So I was like, well, that's kind of interesting. You know, is there a way that I can maybe um, more sort of organically slide into that kind of narration? Absolutely, absolutely. And uh, again, it, it makes a lot of sense that, um, especially for a novel that's covering, you know, so many different angles and things like that, that you would have to kind of write it straight out and then start to shape it into what it eventually um, became. And speaking of juicy characters, our, our next question was, how accurate was Archie and was there a lot of source material? What a character he was. Hmm. Um, so 
<laughs> the, the, the primary source materials I used for creating Archie were um, Agatha Christie's autobiography. Um, and then um, I read, and you know, I really wanted to, I tried not to use too many sources apart from Agatha Christie because I wanted to create her sort of the way she seemed to want to be seen. Um, but I did use a book called um, Agatha Christie and the 11 Missing Days by Jared Cade. Um, and he writes about a lot about Archie and you know what kind of man he was. Um, I feel like I made him, and I mean, this could be completely wrong. This is just my personal feeling. I feel like I made him a little bit more sympathetic than he was in wow. real life. I think in actuality, he was pretty mercenary about um, wanting to end this marriage. And his primary concern was this new woman in his life. Um, so I think that the sort of, um, in my novel, I give him sort of a, a phase of being super remorseful and really being concerned about her and missing her and thinking that he can repair the marriage. I don't believe in reality he ever felt that way. Um, and I do think that he was a pretty arrogant sort of man um, and that he, I don't know if you've looked at photographs of him or anything like that, but he was really dashing and handsome. And I think that he really wanted to be the main event in their relationship. And he, you know, never could have anticipating her having this career that was going to not only take her away from him to some degree, but outshine him so much. Um, Especially in that time period where women weren't supposed to outshine men at all. No. And they didn't. I mean, how no. often did that happen? I don't think he was prepared for it at all. So, so those aspects of his personality, the character I created in the book, um, I did draw from um, historical descriptions of him. Um, and, you know, there's one point where um, I paraphrase, um, he says something like, um, you know, I'm sick of the situation, somebody's got to be unhappy, and I'm tired of it being me. And he, and, and, in Christie's autobiography, she does quote him saying something very similar. All right, all right. Here, here I was thinking, you know, Archie was a bear, and, and what you're telling me is he was an even worse bear than he was, in this, so. it was in this book. So, yeah. Maybe Archie got the um, humanizing redemption he didn't necessarily deserve, but uh, <laughs> made him a little bit more of a three-dimensional character um, that might have been a tiny bit easier to, to swallow because you're yeah. right. He did, even, even in this more human approach, he did come across as very mercenary, very... Yeah, you know, he had um, a job to do and he was going to do it. I will say that I read this somewhere and I wanted to write about it... Um, you know, when I was writing about publicity for, for the book, but I never did because I couldn't find, you know how sometimes you're doing like internet research and you find something and then you lose it. So I couldn't cite it. Um, but I did read somewhere um, that his mistress, his second wife, Nancy Neal, um, predeceased Agatha. And when she died, Agatha wrote him a condolence letter and he wrote her back a very nice letter saying and thanking her for sort of letting letting him go so he could have his years with um, Nancy. Oh, so, all right. Some sort of rapprochement at least at the end. I'm still I'm still seeing the Christie affair hitting the big screen. I feel like I've read somewhere that it's gotten optioned as a movie or series or something like that. Maybe I made that up. Maybe that's wish fulfillment. I'm not sure. Um, but no, it, I, it, ha, it has been optioned as a series. And I actually, oh. I just have recently read um, the script <clears throat> and then it's it's right now imagined as a six episode series. Um, and so I, I just read the script for the first episode and the synopsis of the other series. And it's really good. I mean, she the screenwriter is um, Juliette Tohiti, who mm -hmm. is a British screenwriter who did... Um, she adapted P.D. James's novel, Death Comes to Pemberley. Oh, uh, wonderful. A series, and she did a wonderful movie um, called Testament of Youth, and she's just really, really clever and brilliant. So I'm, I'm excited. Um, I hope it gets made. I'm really excited about it. Do you know who's going to um, produce it or who's going to star in it, or can you give us any of those details? Um, so it was acquired by um, Gotham Group and Miramax TV, 
Um, but there aren't any actors or directors or anything attached to it yet, but I hope there will be based on Juliet's really wonderful script. And I hope they give you an opportunity to have feedback on your baby because you did a lot of research and I would be thrilled if you have any spare time, which I doubt you do, but if you have any spare time to send me any of the titles of the books you used in your research, I'd love to get some of those for our library oh, as yeah, well, awesome. because I think Absolutely. they would certainly be read because I think Agatha Christie just She's always been popular, but I think especially now she's in the lexicon just that much more. Sure. Um, yeah, happy to do that. And also, um, you know, the so I, you know, read wonderful books about and by Agatha Christie. Um, but probably my favorite book that I read, well, the competing two favorite books I read while researching this were about um, the mother and baby homes in Ireland. And one is um, this memoir of a midwife who worked at one of them um, in like the late 50s or early 60s. And it's called A Light in the Window. Her name's Jean Golding. And then there's another amazing um, memoir um, by a man named Paul Jude Redmond. And he was born in a mother and baby home in Cork. Um, and he writes about this is combination of his own history and the history of these homes and um, treatment of unwed mothers in Ireland. And it's just, it's such a fascinating, personal, emotional book. I really recommend it. Excellent. Like I said, I'm always looking for good book recommendations because what happens is readers like myself read something and they're like, I want to know more. I want to know how this, where the information for the story came from or what were the sources. So anything you could shoot my way, yeah, I'll yeah. take a look into it for sure. Yeah, that would be fantastic. Because like, again, oftentimes you don't get to ask the author themselves, what resources did you use to get the factual material for the book? So that's really, that's really interesting. And some of the characters in the book, um, you know, I gave Archie a hard time, but he was not the only unsavory character that we ran into because one of our readers wanted to know more about Sister Mary Claire, that here was this person who was sympathetic, but yet horribly enabling, you yeah. know, and almost wiped out this, the sympathy part from her um, that she had to give because she was enabling these horrific things to happen. So what can you tell us more about her? Um, so I made her up. Um, I do think that, you know, when you have these um, sort of nefarious engines that are embedded in, um, you know, embedded as institutions in a culture, it kind of requires um, characters like her. I mean, and I think there's really something almost sociopathic about her. I mean, I think she's very interested in presenting herself a certain way, but there's no sort of real no, emotion or caring behind that facade. Mm -hmm. um, I, so the idea to write about these homes um, was rooted in a documentary I saw years ago um, that I've been fascinated by and used as a teacher in my classrooms called Sex in a Cold Climate. Um, and again, like I don't want to give anything away, but um, if you watch that documentary, which I recommend, it's only like 45 minutes and you can see it, find it on YouTube. Um, there's an interview with a woman who talks about a confrontation with a nun um, at one of these homes. And that was sort of the, the root of um, both Nan's heartache and motivations and also um, creating a character like Sister Mary Claire who could try to present as caring um, at the same time really doing horrible things and really convincing herself that she was in the right but I think that's a character that's scarily realistic because I think that is how so many awful things can happen in the world. It's all that it takes is, with, uh, I'm going to misquote who it is. I want to say it was, oh gosh, was it Theodore Roosevelt? I'm not sure. Uh, all it takes for evil to prevail in the world is for good men to do nothing. And there is so much truth to that. You can present yourself however you want to be, but at the end of the day, if you let evil things happen, you're ranking right up there with the evil person perpetuating those acts. So yeah, I think it's absolutely. very likely that there were those sorts of people in the mix 
in yeah. these kinds of places. Absolutely, yeah. who made themselves feel better with small kindnesses. I mean, I'm clearly the the priest is the most evil character in the book, but I think I, I would listen to someone who wanted to make an argument that it was actually Sister Mary Claire because she's certainly extremely complicit. I think the hardest thing about it is it's one thing to look evil in the eye when it's just straightforward right there in front of you. It's almost more duplicitous and chilling when it's someone who wants to be perceived as a good person and yet has no moral compass, no soul when it, when it comes to letting someone else's misdeeds go completely under the radar and they have the power to do something different. You know, if, if she was in a way threatened or something like that, maybe you could, you know, bend a little bit. But the fact that they're just willing to step aside and just watch it all unfurl is chilling. Yeah, absolutely. So, absolutely. Because you know there's evil in the world. But to look at someone who had the complicity, had the power to be do something different and chooses actively not to yeah. is something that, that's kind of universal in a lot of stories. So yeah, she, I, she may not have been real, but she was real. Yeah. <laughs> Sadly. <laughs> They're out there. They're out there. Um, so she felt very real to me when I, was, um, when I was reading about her. But regarding real people, have you ever heard from any of the descendants of Agatha, Archie, Nancy, and what, were, what might have been their reactions to the book? Um, I can't, I can't speculate as to what they're, um, I, I, I imagine that they would prefer people not, people leave this episode alone. I will tell you that, um, that in the United States, um, the fair use laws are quite different from the fair use laws in England. Mm. So in the United States, so in the novel, um, as I wrote it, um, part one, part two, part three, all have epigraphs from, quotes from Hercule Poirot. Um, and in the US that's legal because it's only, you know, a certain number of words from different books. So that falls under fair use. Um, in England, if you're using um, quotes from a novel in kind of a decorative way, like an epigraph, you need to get permission. Um, so the, and the Christie estate wouldn't give us permission to use those quotes. Mm -hmm. So in the English edition, the epigraphs aren't there. And also because um, it was the English press who produced the audiobook, the epigraphs aren't in the audiobook. Which, by the way, I want to say to give a plug for the audiobook, I don't know if anybody listened to it, but the actor who narrates it is just phenomenal. She's so brilliant. She just does all the different, I mean, it is it's like having a full cast recording. It's such a virtuoso performance. Yes, she did a, a fantastic job. And if I'm not mistaken, wasn't she one of the actresses in the 1995 Pride and Prejudice? Yes, she plays Charlotte um, in that production. Yeah, and she's just so lovely. She's such a nice person. Um, and I just, um, yeah, I really recommend the audio book, just so, if only for her, uh, just amazing talent. I listened to the audio book and um, I hope you don't mind the comparison. I felt like I was swept into kind of like a Downton Abbey world of, you know, and or, or a Jane Austen kind of experience. And so it was very easy to visualize the people and the places and the characters because fortunately all of that rich material has been become so popular. And so I'm not surprised that the Christie Affair is being made into a series because I think people really like to drop back into that time and kind of see how things were in one way more complex because they didn't have the ways to communicate, but in some ways a little bit simpler. Like, for example, I don't think Agatha could have disappeared for 11 days these days, yeah. not with all no the paparazzi and the internet and smartphones. I mean, I think she really would have had to work hard to yeah. do that. But in the time period she was in and being as well versed as she was in, in those kinds of stories herself, um, she was able to take advantage of a time where she could be a little bit more under the radar when she decided to be. 
Yeah, it's true. And that was a fun thing to think about how um, we sort of lost that ability to, to run away and disappear and, you know, um, be disconnected from everybody. I mean, I can remember, um, you know, pre-cell phone, pre-internet, driving across the country and stopping when I was tired and staying in some hotel and really loving that feeling of like, nobody knows where I am. <laughs> nobody can reach me. Yes. Yeah. And now it's like, my goodness, if you're not reporting on yourself all the time, you're like a missing person. Oh Where, yeah. And I mean, I do too. My daughter complains, like if she doesn't text me back within a second, I'm like, are you okay? What's happened? Where are you? What's going on? We get addicted it's so to that. easy to communicate with people. It becomes so noticeable when you don't. Yes. Yes. But she had a little bit more time to play with before people really started wondering about, you know, where she was. Exactly. Because she wasn't expected to be on everybody's radar all of the time. So that yeah. worked for Agatha. In a way, it wouldn't work today. So I don't think you have to worry about them modernizing your, uh, modernizing your novel um, for the series because it just absolutely would not, it would not work in today's, no, no. Yeah. today's culture. Um, you had mentioned that the Marina Gessner, Gessner is your husband's name, is that correct? Gessner is his last name. Yeah, David it's Gessner. His last name. Okay, so is, is Nina Degramont, is, is Degramont your maiden name? Yes. Yes. Okay. That's, that's my dad's name. We had it. We had someone ask us that because I yeah. guess they were trying to make sure there wasn't another pen name they needed to hunt no, down. No, this, is, this is this is it. This is, this is this it. Is my real, my actual name that I two, use. Yeah. Two identities. Okay. Excellent. Well, like I said, I need to um, hunt down the rest of your books because I found two, but I know there's more out there now. So I'm going to see what else I can find to get for the library for sure you mentioned that you lived in North Carolina do you have any favorite North Carolina authors oh wow that's a really good question um there are so many and honestly at this point a lot of them are my friends so <laughs> I'm trying to think like who to, I love Claude Edgerton and Wiley Cash um and my friend um Jason Mott just won the National Book Award and he's a unlike me a North Carolina native um, so, I mean, it's, and, and, you know, a lot of wonderful transplants, um, my friend Rebecca Lee is an incredible writer, um, I don't think that she would ever call herself a North Carolina writer, but I could be wrong, but Melody Moisey, um, wrote an amazing, um, book called The Rumi Prescription, um, where she and her dad, um, she is Iranian-American and her dad is Iranian, and they did new translations of Rumi's poetry and sort of mixed it together with life advice and biography. And that's a book that came out like right as the pandemic was starting. And I think that if, if it hadn't, cut, if its launch hadn't been interrupted by all the COVID noise, it would have been just a huge book. It's so beautiful. Well, I hope that it gets the attention that it deserves. And like I said, I, I gave up a little while ago trying to write down all these titles oh, yeah, mentioning to me. But anything that you've name dropped, you know, let me know because we're always looking for good recommendations. We get recommendations from our patrons and it's really exciting when we get recommendations from authors as well. And I love how casually you said, oh yeah, and a bunch of them are my friends. Like, <laughs> You know, that of course they would be your friends, but at the same time, it's just kind of like, again, you know, we tend to kind of um, like, a, it's like a mythology with, with other, but really, again, people who are just sharing their ideas and hoping somebody else picks them up and reads them. And that's a great thing about libraries. It gives everybody the opportunity to pick up any books that they want free of cost and just see what there's out there and explore so many different new ideas. Yeah. So speaking of that, um, your book right now is classified in our library as adult fiction, but we had a former media specialist ask us if you feel your book would appeal to young adults. And, and I thought this was a very interesting question given the current climate around books right now. Um, if you feel that it would be considered acceptable for young adults because it does touch on some serious topics. It touches on abortion and sexual abuse and suicide and, and things like that. So what do you think about the Christy affair and young adults? You no, know, I think the thing about young adults, and if we're talking about like 
you know, 14 to 18 year old range mm -hmm. is each person of that age is so different from every other person of that age. And there's such a wide range of reading level and maturity level and emotional maturity level and sensitivity. Um, that I certainly would never say, um, <laughs> you know, no, people that age shouldn't read it. I mean, I think like a precocious reader who had read a lot of adult fiction and who was okay with facing kind of hard things um, would be an ideal reader, you know, especially because there's a whole, you know, I think the, when we first meet Nan in the um, backstory, she's 13 or 14. So I think, I think it could, you know, certainly some, some readers that age would be upset, but some adult readers, I'm sure upset. I will say that, um, I went to, um, the Savannah Book Festival, and they have this great program where the day before the festival begins, they, um, they send authors to schools to give talks. Um, and a group donated like two cases of my book to the school where I was scheduled to talk. And I assumed it was going to be high school, but when I got there, it was an elementary school. So I did have to be like, I don't think this is appropriate. No, <laughs> oh, don't worry. We'll give it to the teachers. <laughs> but high school, I, I would take my chances for sure. Okay. Well, that's really, that's really good to know because sometimes for our um, book club, we get, um, we get some younger readers who oh. want to explore books and they have such fascinating insights and they think of things that maybe some of our older readers either didn't think of or maybe haven't thought about in a long time and yeah. bring such a fresh perspective to the book and I think the way that you wrote the book would be a way to read about those topics in a way that isn't you know what might worry some people about when you read about those topics that they'd be graphic or, or exploitative I didn't feel like they were that Thank you. in the book. They were just kind of part of the fabric of the lives that these people have, have led. And that those lives really, even though they were taking place in the in the 20s, really are not that fundamentally than, different than these 20s. Yeah, so, that's true. Um, yeah, you know, I, I'm glad that um, there's teen appeal there too. And I think you pointed out with reading about Nan at a, at a younger age, that, that could that could draw some teens in to read from that perspective. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, I will say the book is dedicated to um, Liza Jane Hansen, who is a great friend of my daughter's, who is one of those kids who just was always carrying around a book. Like you drive her somewhere and the other kids would be talking and she was like back there reading her book. Um, and she was always so excited um, when I had a new book coming out and has read, you know, I mean, she's 18 now and has been reading my books forever. And she asked, she said, will you do, dedicate your next book to me? I said, sure. Oh, well, that's wonderful. Who doesn't want to have a book dedicated to them? <laughs> yeah. so that's always good to know when books can, can reach across different, different ages and different experiences. And in this particular chat, um, I haven't had any of my book clubs yet. Usually I meet, we meet with them in person. And then there's a group that meets via Zoom. And I'll be very interested to hear what their uh, many and varied opinions are um, on the book. They bring so much of their own life experience to everything they read, which brings me to, did you have any personal experiences or life experiences that you brought to this book? You know, I think the primary experience that I brought to book, the book um, that, you know, is easy for, I would say 99% of us to imagine is I've had my heart really broken by, you know, a callous man. <laughs> <laughs> I had a breakup that made me think that the world was ending. Um, yes. So I, th I think that was the most useful perspective um, that I brought. And, and also I'll say that um, my experience as a mother is very much on the pages of the book. Absolutely. Um, Absolutely. Yeah, I re that absolutely. resonated to me as a, as a, as a mom and also as one of many of millions of women who's had her heart broken in her lifetime. So again, those universal themes that we can all get back to um, brass tacks and relate to. 
absolutely. And I thought it was a very interesting choice of narrator because as I mentioned with uh, Nita Prose and the Maid, you're, as a human being, it just feels like you're naturally inclined to want to trust the narrator, to empathize with the narrator, to relate to the narrator. And I thought, man, initially you don't know Nan's motivations. So right, right off the bat, you're like, ooh, how am I as a woman <laughs> going to relate to a mistress? That's going to be really tough to do. But why did you choose her as the narrator? And what, what did that mean for the story? Um, it was a challenge. Um, because, you know, I knew that, you know, people's hackles immediately go up. Um, but I thought it was a really interesting way in to sort of explore what kind of connection that they would have with each other, even when it's an unwanted connection. You know, it's the sort of oogly, uninvited gaze into your life. And how do you make that, that voice um, somebody who's not going to be repellent to people? And, you know, recognizing that for some people, there's nothing like she could be, her secret goal could be to save humanity from aliens for some reason. And that still wouldn't be justification enough for infiltrating a marriage. So, so you, you know, you have to accept that it's just not gonna be possible for some readers, but, you know, I tried to, certainly her past and her motivation, I thought was sympathetic. Um, and I, I knew that I would have to make her really like Agatha. Like I couldn't, I couldn't let any sort of um, hostile rivalry into her voice when she was talking about Agatha and I had to make her feel kind of guilty about what she was doing. And she, that, that was what was interesting to me because before I found out what her game really was, the fact that she liked Agatha and the fact that in many ways she kind of owned it in terms of what she was doing I begrudgingly could respect that. <laughs> like I was like, all right, well, you know, I'm not entirely completely sold here, but you know, I guess I, I guess I could give it up for that. Where she's not trying to pull the wool over my eyes and she doesn't right. have this vendetta against Agatha. Yeah. But I have to tell you that first scene when they go out to lunch and you're just kind of holding your breath, you're just waiting for that other shoe to drop and then right there after the turns on a dime she's like I know your story I know your game and uh -uh. and really and I don't know if I would I don't know if I'm using the correct form of irony or not but what was really fascinating to me was she thought she was really kind of you know hitting this head on and really she had no idea that she wasn't really yeah. and, the, and the reader didn't know here right. you're thinking, oh, she's really calling a spade a spade, but even she didn't know right. the full tale of what was what was going on. So I thought she was a very interesting choice of narrator, and it forced me to see the, the story in a way that I might I wouldn't have naturally put myself in those shoes. But I was glad to be in those shoes, even if they were even if they pinched at first. Yeah, Thank you. that's a great way of putting it. I like <laughs> I'm like, I don't know about this, but I'm gonna I'm gonna walk a little bit in these shoes and see <laughs> if maybe maybe they're not my style, but um, I'm gonna see where I can take this and see where this see where this story um, takes me. So I thought I thought that was a very interesting person to to choose. But I also wondered, um, along with our readers, if you felt like the book that you wrote echoes. Um, Agatha Christie stories and if that was intentional I know you mentioned the ABC murders did you feel that the structure of the story the mystery within the mystery kind of was in a way an homage to Agatha Christie and what she's written that's what I wanted to do and I wanted to sort of make it like a combination of um like they're they're essentially all the um chapters are either titled here lies sister Mary or the disappearance. And my idea was that there'd sort of be these two narrative styles and one would be this um, kind of Agatha Christie style murder mystery. And one would be more of like an E.M. Forster, or Galsworthy or sort of um, literary fiction of the day. And, you know, as, as I was writing it, I wanted readers to sort of 
at least on some level, be thinking one voice belonged to Nan and one voice belonged to Agatha. And certainly that was Nan's idea. But then as the story unfolds, they kind of, the styles kind of meld together um, and become inseparable. Absolutely, absolutely. And we had a reader who was very interested on what your opinion on justice was in relation to this novel about how, um, you know, in, in some ways you, you get to the end of the story, you feel like, okay, so was justice served or was that justice in the pure sense or justice in the righteous sense? You know, what was, what was your feeling on, on justice in this novel? I mean, I think, and you know, this is purely as far as like what happens on the page. I think there, you know, we all have different ideas about what, what's appropriate justice in a fictional world versus what would be appropriate in the real world. But as far as in a fictional world, um, I think that there's never going to be any complete justice because things were taken away and ruined and rearranged that can never be put right. Um, but I was glad to give, I mean, these girls were living in a world where the laws were so wrong and the ideas of the culture were so wrong that the only way they could find even, you know, a modicum of justice was to make some for themselves. So, so I'm glad I gave them that opportunity on the page. That, that little bit of closure yeah. that um, maybe they couldn't have gotten in real life. And you had touched upon the fact that you know, various parts of the story were fictionalized because you had some latitude to be able to do that. Did you have a vision for the characters that you created? What kind of happened next after the book closes? Or is it, you know, or did you never really go go that extra step and it's just kind of left open ended because it's so in some way so different from the reality? Yeah, I mean, I think I did this kind of meld where at the end, I kind of, you know, I mean, throughout the book, since Nan is narrating it from, you know, point very distant in time, she's able to sort of touch on things that happen afterwards, you know, so we know that um, she kept in touch with Chilton, that, you know, we know what happens to Finbar after they separate. Um, we know that she marries Archie and, you know, is able to be in Teddy's life um, you know, for her whole life. Um, and then, you know, I, I guess I envision um, Agatha after, after this sort of fictional interlude going back to the trajectory that her actual life had. Getting back to brass tacks and writing those books. Writing a lot of books. <laughs> Traveling the world. And, and, and the that real life, sometimes uh, truth is stranger than fiction. Almost always. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. It's interesting because you already answered some of the questions that our readers had about, you know, is Nan a sympathetic character? And you did develop that later in the story about her additional motivations that weren't apparent to either Agatha or the reader. And about, you know, how much the mystery within a mystery was fictionalized, which it was great that you had that latitude. I was glad that you did because if it had been much more structured, it would have been really hard to insert a narrative um, uh, in there. Um, but one question that did come out that we they haven't answered yet is Teddy truly Nan's daughter in real life? Um, in real life. I is mean, she the mistress's daughter in real life or is it just one of those things where it was something you speculated or oh, is it yeah, no, I mean, in real, in Agatha Christie's life, um, as far as I know, she gave birth to her. her daughter was not adopted and she, it was, you know, her and her. So that was completely made up for the, for the book. But it yeah. felt so real. Like it could, it could have been so real because, you know, one of the things I appreciated about that was that had Teddy been adopted, it was never presented as Agatha thinking of Teddy as anyone else but her daughter. Yeah. Like it was never my adopted daughter. It was simply my daughter. Yeah. And I thought that was very heartwarming um, and speaks to how adoptions can play out for so many oh, yeah. people that that is, you may not have birthed that child, but for all intents and purposes, that that is your 
child mm -hmm. and how on the other end of the spectrum, how hard that has to be for the person who willingly or unwillingly gave that child up and feels yeah. that same um, kinship to them. So our final question of the night, because I have been reminded that we are at seven o'clock and we just had so many things to talk about. It was amazing. Um, I had such a good time. And um, the burning question I have and our readers have is, what can we read from you next? Is there a novel in the works? Can we get excited? Um, there's a novel in the works. I think it's going to be a little while. It's too early to really talk about it. Okay. But I'm trying. You, you can, there's, like I said, I've got nine other books so or eight other books. So if you have it. If, if you need okay. something to do while you're waiting. <laughs> okay. Well, I we completely respect secrecy because, of course, you know, no one wants to let the cat out of the bag too early. We don't want to cause it you or anyone else reader writer's block. Um, but if you ever want to drop a hint for a publication date in the future to me, I will keep my eyes peeled to okay. add that book to our will. shelves. And if you could send me a list of any of the titles that you've dropped, I, including, of course, your own, I will. Um, see what we can add to our collection. And, and again, thank you so much, Nina, for taking the time this evening to, to uh, answer, like I said, quite literally the, the 20 the questions. You know, I could have just chatted with you all now. You were just, you were such a delight to get to know and know more about your book. And we're just so thrilled that we had this experience with you. And I'm checking to see if there was any um, more questions. Nope, it looks like we've answered answer the questions. So this is great. And, and we have lots of people saying, thanks, Nina. Wonderful to meet you. This was so awesome. So, so fantastic job. Kudos. Thank you so, thank you so thank much you again. for having me. I appreciate it so much. It was really fun to talk to you. You are also a delight. Thank you. Thank you. I really appreciate that. A, a, a literary rock star told me I did a good job. That, <laughs> that made my week. Um, for those out there who don't know, our library's experienced a little um, calamity. We had a lightning strike and a little fire. Fortunately, none of our collections were harmed. And more importantly, um, everyone was evacuated safely. We're looking forward to reopening here in a um, few days time, we hope. Um, but it has not dented people's enthusiasm for books and for reading and certainly not for authors. So keep up the great work and we look forward to reading more from you in the future. Thank you so much. Bye, Nina. Have a great night Bye. and best you wishes too. in the future. Thank you to you too. All right. Take care. Bye. All right. Thank you, everybody, for joining us tonight. We hope you had a fantastic time and we look forward to hopefully having you join us again when we interview and converse with Brendan Slocum of the Violin Conspiracy in August. Have a great night. See you next time. Bye-bye.